Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, the host of this exciting show. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from across Canada to learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on this show to better understand a community is to talk to the people who actually live and work there, shockingly. Please help me welcome today's show, the mayor of High Prairie in the province of Alberta, Brian Panasic. And I probably just pronounced your last name wrong there, Brian. I do apologize. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Thanks. For, yeah, it's Panasic. Panasic. Uh, yeah. Brian, let's start with the very first question that I've asked municipal councillors and mayors and Reeves all across this great country, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? You know what, I uh, I think it just came from, you know, the being involved in the community. Uh, you know, we've got a, that attitude that, you know, if something's, you don't think something's working, you got to get in and try and fix it. It's not just, uh, you know, it wasn't something that my parents talked about at the dinner table much. It came, you know, more out of the, the fact that, you know, back in... 2012 or somewhere around there, we had municipal affairs, was not happy with how the council was running at the time. There was a review of council and, you know, we started, we, meaning me and some of my friends were talking about it. And, uh, you know, it, we're more of the people that, uh, you know, if you, you want to see something change, you got to get in and do it, not just complain about it. So, you know, we're, uh, you know, it's kind of a funny story, actually. I was sitting around a campfire and, uh, you know, just before the nomination deadline for the 2013 elections. And, you know, we were talking about the reviews and some of the things that had to change. And, and uh, you know, somebody said, well, I'll run if you run. And I said, well, I'll run if you run. <laughs> and at the end of the day, we both said, OK, we're in. So that's how we got started. So. In 2013, while jokingly you say you were just sitting around a fire table, a uh, fire uh, or just around a table talking about this, was there an issue? Was there an issue that was coming up that often over and over again that you were thinking about saying to yourself, I can get on council because in 2013 you ran as a councillor. You did not run for mayor in the first election that you ran, but in 2013 you ran for council. You said, I'm going to run and I'm going to try to fix X if elected what was x for you or was there many issues that you were talking about because you talk about the review that municipal affairs did but there also is local issues that you want to try and fix as well isn't there yeah and and you know what i think you know what at the time i wanted to see the council working more smoothly following the the, the rules and you know and making sure that those recommendations that were made were implemented uh, so yeah, there was multiple issues. A lot of it was just in how council was being run and wanted to, did not really know all of the intricacies or what was being done, what wasn't, but thought, yeah, we need to do something. And what was that something, if you don't mind me asking, because you get elected in that election and uh, let's, let's put it all on the table. What was the first thing that you thought you needed to change? Because you don't just randomly run for uh, council without having a plan of how to fix it if elected. Yeah. Well, the, you know, one of the things that, uh, the first thing we did was look at the, uh, it was called the Jones Rude report that, uh, that the review that was done and, we sat down as a council and said, let's go through this and all of the recommendations that they had made and make sure that these are getting implemented. So that, that was step one. That was, uh, and that took a long time to, to get through all of those and make the policy changes and everything else that needed to, to, to happen to get, uh, get everything on the right track. Do you think it's on the right track as of, almost 10 years after first getting elected? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I think we're much better. There's still areas to improve, right? There's, uh, it's a never ending, uh, continuous improvement process. So I want to jump back to that first election. And I want to talk about the election period in general. 
because I, I know High Prairie. I, I used to live in Big Lakes County. I worked in Slave Lake, so I know High Prairie quite well. Um, I know that the community is a unique community. There is a lot of issues that people may have, a lot of micro issues that people may have, whether it be potholes, whether it be upgrades to certain facilities, whether it be infrastructure. When you were door knocking, and I want to try and take you back 10 years ago in 2013, what were you hearing most about? Do you remember? Was it more macro issues or was it more micro issues? Like was education a big topic or was it the MA report or infrastructure or healthcare? What was it? Well, I, I think the, the same things that you hear about now is uh, <laughs> high tax rates, right? I mean, we want lower taxes was yeah, probably the biggest thing that you hear about. And uh that hasn't changed after the the other elections I've been on. That's uh, the common thread that you get all the time. Um, and then there was the, like I said, there was people at that time where, you know, we want to make sure that this town is being run more efficiently and effectively and that they're getting uh, the best bang for their tax dollar. You get elected in 2013 and... For you, what was that experience like seeing your name on the ballot for the very first time? And in subsequent elections since, do you still get that same sense of what have I done, putting my name forward and putting my name into this political realm? Because as municipal councillors, you were on the front line of politics. If if your government shuts down or things that don't happen in your government municipally, people know about it the day after. Federally, provincially, that's different. For you, what was that experience like to put your name forward and seeing your name on that ballot? Yeah, you know what? It, it has been very interesting. Um, like I said, I was not, <clears throat> you know, really involved with politics, did not follow it really closely. Uh, so getting on... Uh, council and learning all of the what happens and how it happens and how you make things happen. It was a real learning experience. And I, I really, you know, anybody should get on just to see how, what you can do, what you can't do. Because I know, you know, we were hoping or I was thinking that you could make changes much quicker and easier <laughs> than uh, following the processes that have to be followed. And, you know, they're there for good reasons, but it, it doesn't allow you to uh, be as nimble and you're only one voice with uh, several other voices and everybody has different opinions oftentimes and you have to work to try to get everybody on the same page. So, yeah, it, it's been a very interesting uh journey so how much weight do you put on yourself to make sure that there is respect around the, the the council table as mayor and even as a counselor but also understanding that while respect is important difference of opinions is also important as well because you need to be able to hear from someone who may be completely opposing what you're putting forward but you have to be able to openly have a, a, a respectful dialogue and conversation. Do you put weight on yourself to make sure that the what happens at council is respectful, but also open to disagreements? A absolutely. Um, you know what, if I really value differences of opinions because it really makes you uh, think about why you believe this is the right way or that's the right way and having other discussions really can open up your mind. Um, I don't know how many times I've gone to a meeting and you've read your agenda package and you think, okay, this is how we need to, to proceed on this particular issue. And then once you hear everybody's discussions and their rationale, I, I've changed my point of view and I go, okay, I never thought of that perspective or that other way of looking at it. And, uh, you know, you need to be prepared to change. Do you think that makes you a better politician slash mayor when you're able to adapt to new information as it arises? Because politicians will often say they don't make mistakes. I'm not saying you'd say that, but there are some politicians who say, we don't make mistakes. Everything we do is correct. But for someone like you who just said you're willing to go into a council meeting with an open mind, do you think that makes you a better person and a better uh, representative of your community? 
Well, I think so. And I, I think that a lot of our councils the same way. I don't think uh, we go, yeah, we, we do everything right. <laughs> I mean, we try and make the best decisions that we have with the information that we have at that time. And, uh, you know, we've made decisions and then you get more information that you didn't have at the time. And then you go, oh, that wasn't probably the best decision that we could have made. But, uh, you know, at the time with what we had, that was uh, the best decision. And where do you balance the information you get from your council reports? Because this is information that administration has put together with the information you gather from the residents. Is it residents are always right or is it administration or is always right? Or is there a balance? And I've never asked a mayor this, but I see, it seems like you're a good guy who would be able to answer this question, Brian. <laughs> uh, good question. And, and that you're, you're, you hit on a very good point because there, there is, like you say, even around our council table, <laughs> you get different perspectives. And then when, you know, uh, administration who does prepare your agenda packages uh, they have a perspective, and oftentimes, uh, you know, when you're talking to residents, you can get different perspectives, and it is a balancing in there, and uh, you do have to balance, and I think it's important, and I like to, and I know some of our other counselors too, will, when you see something coming up on your agenda package, run it by some of your, your friends and, and get a feel for what they think of it. I know, uh, you know, we have, uh, I have a lake lot out at, uh, at uh, Lesser Slave Lake, and it's one of our, uh, when you're sitting around on the weekend around the campfire, it's a, it's a topic of conversation. And a lot of my friends, they, they look forward to, okay, what's on the agenda? Let's have some discussions. And, and getting their feel and getting some ideas on uh, what they think should be done. And uh, it really helps to clarify what what you should do and have the perspective of of the residents do you how do you balance it though because you you have to look at many different opinions because if i go ask 100 people in your community they're all going to give me a different opinion on one subject and i guarantee you every city and town is dealing with this as well but you at the end of the day have to make that final choice you and your fellow counselors have to make a, that final choice how do you do that? Because you have to make sure you're doing the best work to move the town forward, but not forget about the people who've elected you to do that job. So how do you balance the needs and wants of your community with the betterment of your community? Because I can imagine that those people in that ice fishing shack probably give you some strong language if you vote against something or vote for something in a, a way that they don't like. Yeah, no, and and uh, like you said, you're you're going to get a lot of different opinions as you go around uh, the community. You're going to have difference uh, of opinions even around uh, the seven of us around the council table. So it is a real balancing act, and and for me, it's it's listening to the arguments, uh, knowing you know what. What do you feel is right in this particular case? What would be the best for your community? And, uh, you know, going with that and hope that you make the right decision. Have you balanced the work life and the personal life of a mayor since in 10 years since being first elected in 2013? Because you're not going off to Edmonton to do your job. You're not going to Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community 24-7. So I'm imagining if you go to Friesen Bros tomorrow, you will get stopped and you will probably get people asking you questions about issues that are important to them. But there are some days you probably just want to be Brian. You just want to go out and just go grab a uh, jug of milk and come home and not waste 20, 40, 50 an hour talking to people sometimes. Not waste, but you just want to go home and get uh, do your thing. Have you found a balance? Uh, yes, I'm going to say, I mean, you're you're absolutely right to, uh, you know, my wife has said, Brian, can you go and uh, get this from the grocery store and then I'll... Uh, I'm not back for 45 minutes and she go, what are you doing? I need this stuff. <laughs> and it's, uh, oh, I'm just having conversations. And, uh, and before you know it, it's 45 minutes to go and, uh, like you said, go get a jug of milk and buy. Uh, so 
there are absolutely right. You have the people that want to talk to you. And, uh, you know, if I'm in a rush, I'll just say, look, I got to go and we can talk about this another time. But uh, are people up for that? Are people what, willing uh, to accept the fact that you're willing to say, I, I don't have time now. Here's my card. Give me a call tomorrow or email me. And I'm happy to talk to you later on about this issue. I think most of them are. I think they understand that you got other commitments. I'm sure some would like to, when they've got you there and you're not always seeing you, that they really want to express their opinions at that time. But overall, I think people understand you got a balance. I mean, as a mayor in a small town, I have a full time job on top of this. So, you know, you're you're balancing, you know, your your work life, your personal life, and then your your council responsibilities. So there's and then your family on top of that. So there's there's lots of things to, to consider and balance. And most people understand. I want to talk about the educational experience that you've had over the last 10 years on council and as mayor. What has been the biggest learning curve? Because you openly admit it that you're kind of green to politics. You did not know a lot about politics before entering that race, but you've been elected in three subsequent elections, 2013, 2017, 2021. 2017, 2021 as mayor. What has been your biggest learning curve and what advice would you give? Because there's a lot of new mayors and new councillors across this great country who are in your position right now who are going, I was green before I got here and I don't know what I'm doing potentially. What advice and what educational experience have you learned? Uh, Good question. I I think, you know, if I was talking to somebody, realize that uh, when you get involved, it's not just going to a council meeting uh, twice a month. There is a lot of other work that happens, uh, you know, before the meetings you have subcommittees and committees that you have to be uh, involved in and uh, it takes far more time than I really recognized when I got into it I thought okay this is just uh, you know two meetings a a month and you're going to get through this quite easily and then it it was an eye-opener to realize just how much extra work there is and I know that Alberta municipalities have put out uh, you know some good information for elected officials now to to make sure that they go into it with their eyes open. And I think that information has been, uh, you know, very good to make people aware. I want to turn to my second segment because I am cautious of time. And this segment is about the town of High Prairie in general. And before I ask this question, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is his opinion. So, Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this, what is the biggest issue facing the town of High Prairie today? Um, I'm going to say the biggest issue. Or issues. Yeah, or issues. (laughs) You know, one of the, the biggest things, and I'm I'm happy to say we're getting it resolved, and it's been something we've been working on for quite a few years, is getting high-speed connectivity into our community. We've heard from residents, especially with COVID uh, and uh, trying to get online and the poor connectivity. Uh, we are now getting, you know, through, I'm going to say it's been three, four years of working on getting you know, fiber into our town and fiber to the homes, we, they are laying fiber as we speak. So for me, that's been, uh, it was one of the biggest issues and it's getting resolved. So I'm really happy about that. It's been a a huge success. And I think it's gonna make a huge difference uh, to our community. We had heard about people that were not taking jobs here because they needed good high-speed connectivity to do their work. Uh, Some of them were uh, architects that needed to send plans back and forth and they wanted to get here, but with the connectivity speeds that they could get, uh, it took High Prairie off the table. I know our businesses that need to connect to central mainframes, you know, with their... uh, uh, central offices and stuff that were having issues. So that to me was one of our big issues. And I'm so thrilled that it's getting resolved. And hopefully by the uh, 
middle of summer will be connected. Does that change High Prairie? Is that a game changer for High Prairie when it comes to the future of the municipality? I really think it is. I think it just it keeps us in the game. If we did not have high speed and, you know, and other communities are getting it, it just puts us further behind the, the eight ball. So having that, uh, that risk factor eliminated just allows people, it allows businesses to come into our community. Uh, you know, if you don't have the high speed connectivity, some people may move somewhere else. Uh, you know, they want to, they want their kids to go to school, be able to get connected well, uh, so many things. And, you know, I just look at our town and uh, we have not been able to do some, um, I'll call it modernization of some of our processes because you just can't go online. We didn't have the speeds to do things. And uh, once we're connected with the town we'll be able to really modernize some of our processes and so it is it is a game changer in my opinion so when that does happen in the summer as you've just laid out what's next because growth is something that a lot of communities are facing uh dealing with right now the lack of growth the potential sustainable growth that they're seeing while internet high speed fiber optic internet is great it's a great stepping stone to potentially start growing your community what are you doing as council to also start moving that conversation forward because people are looking for houses people are people are looking to for places to set up their businesses how are you attracting people to high prairie yeah no uh, good question and i think one of the it is an issue. I mean, we have housing issue in, in town. It's one of our issues of trying to get, uh, I'm going to say appropriate housing for the right people to get in. Uh, we have some some housing available, but not sorry. always. What sorry, people... what do you mean by appropriate housing? I just, want to, I just want to confirm what you're talking about because I'm thinking low income, I'm thinking subsidized housing, I'm thinking high-end housing, townhouses. What are you talking about appropriate housing? Okay, good question. Again, I, I believe that me for us, uh, it is especially for the young professionals a place to go. And it's uh, because some of the people coming in, you, there's houses that they can rent, but if you're a, you know, a young teacher moving into town, you don't necessarily want to, to rent a three bedroom home. Um, so they would like, you know, that kind of things. We had people move into town that are doctors and don't want to have uh, yard work and everything else. And we don't have a lot of nice condos, you know, that they could get into. And that's why I'm saying appropriate housing. That's what but, I mean. No, thank you. I just want to clarify that because people might take that into two different scenarios. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, housing's an issue and we need to work on, on you know, improving that, keeping the, the businesses in town. And we've done some things to, I guess, hopefully attract and keep the businesses in town. One of the things that we did is uh, we had uh, local control or what was, I can't think of the term right now, but where we... Uh, any developments into town took a little longer because you had to come to council to say, this is what we wanted to do and develop and make a pitch. And we got, you know, we changed that. So if the, if it falls within the land use bylaws, then the, it doesn't even come to council. They can just go ahead and administration can fast track that particular uh, business and they, they don't have to do much more. So it's little things like that. We've tried to make it more friendly to, to new businesses come into town. Has it been challenging over the last few years for the town of High Prairie when it comes to the fiscal issues? Um, <laughs> COVID-19 has changed the name of the game when it came to taxes over the last few years? I know you just laughed, but it's an important question that I'm assuming a lot of people are dealing with right now, especially people in your position. And when I talk to mayors and councillors, they're raising this issue. You only have one tax base and you need to grow your city. You need to plan for the future, but you can't do it on the back, completely on the back of the people who live there right now. 
How do you see yourself as mayor in that role of helping navigate the way that the finances are spent without being in the weeds of day-to-day operations of your government? Because you're elected to pass a budget that could potentially bring an increase to people's pocketbooks. Yeah, you're very right. And I I know it's probably the same with every uh, councillor and mayor you've talked to. There is, uh, I haven't heard of one councillor that's, oh, we have enough money. We don't have any concerns there. It's, it's, it's a non-issue. And, and I can tell you about, you know, infrastructure in our community. And I've talked to other mayors around, they have the same issues. We have a upgrades that we need to do to our water treatment plant. Uh, We have lift stations that need to get replaced. And and if I look at those two items that we're looking at right now, it's, you know, a a little two and a half million dollars for those things. We have a tax base of approximately 1,100 rate payers. And to put two and a half million dollars on those 1,100 rate payers, it's not an easy task to do. So, you know, I see part of our job as council is to to work with administration, to apply on the grants, to uh, lobby the government, to the province and federally to try and get the grants. You know, we talked a little bit about uh, getting high speed into our community. We were able to do that because we were able to tie into the broadband fund, the grant to help do that. So it's those kinds of things that we work on to try and keep our uh, infrastructure going. Did the RCMP download from the federal government hurt High Prairie anyway, in any way? Absolutely. Um, You know, it's an additional $150,000 for us because we're under 5,000 people before uh, we did not have, we were not charged for RCMP. And now we're we're getting charged uh, about 150,000, and it looks like it's going up. I might not be exactly right, but in that ballpark. But it does. But there is a price tag attached to the RCMP that the, the currently, because there is FCM and Alberta municipalities who are lobbying the federal government for them to pay it instead of municipalities that you're on the hook for right now, right? Yeah. Well, there's the uh, the RCMP negotiated an R. Uh, you know, retro pay with their new uh, collective agreement. And, uh, you know, that was retroactive for a few years. So that that retro pay was huge. We're fortunate in our community and that because we're under 5,000 people, uh, the province says that you're not on the hook for the retro pay. Okay. Okay. But you still do have 150,000 price tag. Yes, and because of the increases, our rate's going to go up in the future. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't say awesome, but the RCMP is a, a much-needed service in our communities, but it, it sucks that it has to happen on the backs of, uh, of the community members, but we only have one tax base. I want, right. to, I want to talk about your community and their residents, because you as mayor have probably heard about the issues that your community members are facing. While you talk about broadband, while you talk about growth, while you talk about finances, your communities are going to be talking about potholes. They're going to be talking about streets. They're going to be talking about uh, service levels at your facilities. How do you balance them? Because you have a certain amount of money each year to budget. You can't run deficits and you have to kind of pick the winners and losers of the issues that people are having whether that be pothole X on Main Street or pothole Y that's on John Street, who you might know. You have to look at those and decide who is going to get their issue fixed over another person. How do you see yourself balancing that issue with the needs of the entire community? Because you can't look at the entire community without looking at the individual person. No, you're right. And uh, I think what we do to try to balance that is use our uh, some long term planning. You know, we have uh, capital plans for, you know, the next five years and what's what's on the, the record, what's a priority. And by setting those, we know what streets are going to get uh, repaired. We know when the water lines are going to get repaired. So there, there is a plan there. And I mean, we look at that every year come budget time because those 
plans change, all of a sudden we're getting a, a bunch of water leaks in the middle of winter in an area that we didn't know. And so we might change that plan to, you know, put the water line and redo the water and sewer on that block versus another block. So it's an ongoing balancing process, but to have a plan and to be able to go to your, uh, you know, say, look, I know that the road is not good on this block, but it is scheduled to get done in uh, two years. So, and we also will work with them and our and say, you know what, we'll do some fill the potholes for now, and and know that it's going to get redone in two years. So, try to work with the the local concerns on that level also. I've been talking about apathy a lot on my sh- my show with the municipal councillors because I, I feel like there's a very big apathetic tone when it comes to municipal governments. Voter turnout is going down. I, I'm not sure in the town of High Prairie how it was in 2021, but there is a apathetic nature when it comes to municipal politics, in my opinion. For you, is do you see an apathetic nature when it comes to municipal governments of be, people being involved in giving their opinions when it comes to the day-to-day issues that your community are facing? I'm going to say no. We oh, had, uh, you're, you're the I first one to say this. You're the first person right? I've asked in this over the last few weeks that has said no to me. Yeah. You know what? Uh, you know, I look at how many people have been running for the elections when they come up there's still a lot of people interested in running our voter turnout still been uh, consistent uh, you know maybe not as high as you'd like to see but uh, it's still still fairly high i know and i i talk to so many residents uh, about their issues and concerns i don't know if there's a, a lot of apathy people are pretty passionate about their concerns. Why do you think that is? Why do you think High Prairie is a unique entity in that situation? Is it because of council or is it something that's in the water up there? I gee, I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was all like that. I didn't really <laughs> think it was that uh, much apathy in other areas. Well, I, I think it comes down to the fact that there's the vocal minority. You hear from the regular people, that, the issues that people have on a regular basis, but the majority of people, and I think this is where the question is a little convoluted in some sense, that the majority of people want their water turned on when they turn on their tap. They want their garbage picked up and they want low taxes. After that, they're okay unless there's a big issue that's facing them. And I think that's where they're talking, these councillors and mayors that I've talked to, where when you go out for public engagement, when you ask people, what are your priorities? People may not want to give their feedback or may think, okay, I've got other things important to do. So, but you're saying, no, people are actually willing. If you have a community survey or you want feedback at a public open house, people will show up. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right. That there is a, a certain segment that's much more vocal uh, than other parts. And there is a, uh, you know, the more silent majority are out there, but uh, it, if you give them a chance to give their opinion, they usually will. And uh, you can, we have, a, you know, discussion boards on social media that are very active in the community. And again, it's, it's a lot of the same people oftentimes, but there's a lot of different people that will chime in and, and get, get involved in things like that too. So yeah, I, you're right. There isn't always uh, the majority is tends to be a little quieter, but I think they're still involved. And if things are going OK, they don't speak up. I think the real thing happens if things aren't working right or the way they want it is when you're going to hear. Or if they sit around a table and say, well, you know what? You should get involved and run for office or no, you should get run and run for office. Exactly. (laughs) I think everybody should. It's a real (laughs) eye opener. It certainly is. I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time. And I like talking about this one because it's very important to me. Tourism. I love tourism. I've said, if you come on the show, I will come to your community and spend my hard earned economic dollars in your community. So I'm going to be back in my old stomping ground of high prairie here shortly. I'm looking forward to it. So mayor, as I have listeners from across Canada and around the world, and I have viewers from across Canada, what should people do if they come to visit the town of high prairie? And what are some of the hidden gems? 
Uh, you know what? We have uh, a lot of hidden gems. Some of them are just in the town, they're in the surrounding region, but right in the town, like coming up in the next week, we have our gun show. It, it's very popular. We get people from all over the region coming in for that. You know that in May, we have a powwow coming up. There's a the North Country Fair that's out of town. Um, but that's a big event that brings people from all over in June. You know, we have our rodeo. It's a pro rodeo in August, and that's a, a big event that brings people in. We have uh, an Intersect Music Festival that's been running the last couple of years. That's in late August that brings people in. You know, those are some of the events that are happening. And, you know, we have lots of facilities in our town, too, that... Uh, you know, people might be interested in seeing our museum. We have great walking trails. We have a, a really beautiful indoor pool and water slide, that kind of thing. And you talk about hidden gems. You know, I'm going to say nothing uh, as too much right in town, but just outside of town. You know, we have uh, Shady Acres uh, Winery. We have the Easy Bar Ranch that has a corn maze. We, you know, they do horseback riding and they have water slides. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of those things. We have beautiful golf course, a nice gun range, lots of things that you can do. Where do, what you do should you do? be coming up. I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, but what do you do after a stressful day at work? After a stressful day at council, after a stressful day, where do you go into the community or the outskirts of the community to, to just decompress, to let it all go away and reconnect with yourself? Is there a hidden watering hole or is there a a, a fish shack out on Lesser Slave Lake that yeah. you go to? Well, you know what? The lake is huge for me. I have a lot in the summer, so I go out and, uh, and lots of times I'll just spend time out at the lake. And in the winter, I do have an ice fishing shack and we'll just go out there and, uh, you know, fish and decompress out there. Personally, I like to, to do some physical exercise. I'm very, uh, you know, we play hockey a couple of nights a week in the, the winter and you know, getting together with that group and having a bunch of laughs is always uh, great to do. Um, my last question for you, Mayor, and it's the million dollar question. And take as long as you want to answer this question, if you wish. In your opinion, what makes the town of High Prairie such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? It's the people. Uh, and I, you know, I'm sure that comes out in other things, but we have a, a lot of great people around and a real strong volunteer spirit in our community. There's, you know, I, I mentioned the, uh, the rodeo. It's put on by our High Prairie Elks and uh, it's all volunteers and it's a top notch event that puts it on. The volunteers get together and make that happen. The gun show, the groups that make that happen, uh, you know, our minor hockey and the, the tournaments and the volunteers involved in that. It just, we have a great spirit of volunteerism. Our uh, volunteer fire department is, you know, they're, they're always looking for more members, but they have a very good, uh, solid core of people now. So, you know, the people really step up in this town and make it a great place to live. Mayor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule and sitting down for the last 40 minutes and talking about yourself and your community. Um, municipalities across Alberta, municipalities across Canada are better served with people like you at the table. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, it's been a treat to talk with you. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a gosh darn conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and sometimes it just helps us be better people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. Just keep talking.